So welcome everybody. Um, tonight's webinar, we're going to be talking about all things adherence and supported self-management and behaviour change and personalised care. So lots to get through in the next hour. My name's uh, Jill Rawlinson. I'm um, first and foremost tonight a PhD student and I'm going to be sharing with you uh, my research project. So I think an opportunity uh, to share the research journey with you a little bit um, and what that's been like and uh, maybe inspire you in your next stages to perhaps and get engaged in more research, perhaps go on to an MSc or PhD in the future if you're not already studying at that level. Um, and that, as you probably guessed, is all about adherence and self-management. And we're going to um, talk about the implications of that and hopefully give you a little bit of a some things to take away to have a go with with your patients when you're next on placement um, or perhaps embed in your own in your own life as well. Um, my other role is as one of the assistant directors. Uh, I lead on education and workforce at the CSP. Um, so you may have met me on one of the student webinars where we've been talking about all things placements and things. And my background is, is as a lecturer. I used to work at UCLan. Um, in Preston, the University of Central Lancashire, uh, until a couple of years ago. So it's really lovely to be back in the classroom, albeit virtual. So uh, please do feel uh, like you want to get engaged and, and do feel free to ask questions if you, if you want to. So let's get going. The real sort of driver for my PhD was, was this question. And it's, um, I was uh, very recently and still have a, an NHS contract working at, at Salford um, in their MSK services as an advanced practitioner and many patients who I saw who were coming back for a musculoskeletal assessment I'd ask them about the care they'd had what sort of treatments they'd had how they'd gone and lots of people said I went to physio and all I got was a sheet of exercises and this really fascinates me because we know that exercise is a fantastic modality we know that it is a very effective intervention for many, many conditions, both within musculoskeletal and in the wider um, specialties. Um, and we know also that doing exercise or doing specific instructions given by physiotherapists is it, difficult, it's tricky. Um, there's lots of things that will influence whether we do them or not. Um, but it's very easy to make judgments and assumptions that people perhaps haven't felt committed or they've not, um, you know, given it that they're, they're lazy or, you know, they can't be bothered. So why should I be bothered to give you a things if you can't play your part? And the important thing is that though that sheet of exercises might have been the gold standard treatment for that condition. But if we haven't um, engaged with our patient or service user in a way that they value that and, 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 and engaging with it, then we are, we are missing a trick and that individual patient is missing out on, on optimal treatment. So as I say, tonight we are going to discuss the project um, that I've been doing. We're going to explore adherence and behaviour change. We're going to sort of touch a little bit on personalised care and what this means. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to the COMB model and uh, the underpinning theoretical domains framework. If, if um, So you can perhaps go and, and read a little bit more about that if you're interested. Um, and sort of hopefully, as I say, give you some take home um, things to, to have a go at with your patients when you're next on placement. Um, if you want to go to menti.com, if you've used that before, if you just type in menti.com into a browser window and enter the code on the screen there, there's a QR code if you um, prefer. That should work, hopefully. Um, there's a question on there which um, says, think of a behaviour you want to change, um, i.e. do more or less of, and think about what are the barriers enable or enablers to you doing this behaviour. So what stops or helps you do that thing that you think you should be doing more of? So if you can do that, be really great for you to think about your own behaviours and what influences those. So hopefully you can see those come in. 
times coming up there. Motivation, studying, knowledge, um, increasing exercise, clear action plan, laziness, enjoyment, peer support. Brilliant. This is um, very reflective of the literature in this area, I would say. Uh, distracted understanding, empowered, busy, why, judgment, procrastinating, motivation is sitting there right in the middle, confidence is really up there, too tired, arrogance, studying. So have a little look at that and I'm sure you will all resonate with lots of those reasons and remember our patients who are just people like you and me are going to have lots of those issues when we're thinking about giving them a behavior uh, sorry a um, intervention or or plan of something to do behavior change what is it um so when we're thinking about behavior change, you all then just thought about some behaviors. It might have been doing more exercise. It might have been drinking more water. It might have been um, going to um, stop smoking. It might be drink less wine. It might be um, stop putting off doing that assignment that you um, that you want to get on with. There's all sorts of behaviors that we we are required to do every single day and when we're thinking about physiotherapy and engaging with our patients we need to think about what is the behavior that actually needs to change what are we asking people to do and who needs to change their behavior is it the individual in front of them is it you as the as the physiotherapist um, who needs to do what and when basically um, and who decides what behavior needs to change? Is that your job as the physiotherapy student or physiotherapist to decide what your patient needs to do? Or is that thinking about the patient's decision? And, and is what you think is their, the behavior they need to change necessarily what they think they need to change? Self-efficacy is a really important construct, and that's really about how capable we feel that we can enact that change. So some of those um, things that have just come up on the word cloud there, like confidence, you know, if you don't feel particularly confident that you think you could do that behavior, then you're much less likely to actually undertake that and adhere. And do our patients and service users want to change? A big bugbear of mine is because a patient turns up for an appointment, virtual or face to face, that we assume that they want to engage in our exercise or rehabilitation program. Maybe they just came because they got a letter saying to come along and they had no idea what it was going to entail. Uh, maybe they just want to work out what's wrong and for somebody to tell them that they're not going to die of this shoulder pain. It's what it is and the fact you know, it, it, it's nothing made, you know, serious that's going to cause them long lasting harm, then maybe that's enough. So we we need to think about whether people really want to engage with what it is that we want want to do. We need to think about those barriers and enablers, which you've, you've already started thinking about. And we need to really think about why do people, including ourselves, act the way they do? And I'll tell you one thing, it's not just down to knowledge because many of us know uh, lots of information and stuff about things that are good for us, things that are bad for us, but it doesn't mean we're necessarily acting that way. So in terms of adherence, there's a definition here of adherence and I'm sure many of you um, are very clear on what adherence means. Adherence is the latest sort of terminology we've had things like compliance which feels a little bit led by the the, the um, clinician rather than you know you will comply with my orders so adherence is is the world health organization sort of latest but when we when we do talk about prescribing medication we use the word concordance a lot as well how concordant is the individual with the agreed recommendations but for the purposes of this we're going to talk about it in terms of adherence and the definition you could read there, it's that 
extent to which the person's behavior corresponds with the agreed recommendations. And what's really important there is if we want to measure or understand adherence, we need to know and the individual needs to know what it is we are asking of them. We need to agree the dosage, the what, the when, the where, how it will feel, etc. Because if we don't know that, we can't understand if people adhere. And you'll see on the, the little um, hexagons on the right there that you'll, you'll see that there's lots of issues that come in the way of adherence. It's a very complex uh, phenomena. How do we know if somebody's adhered or not? What if they do a little bit of what you've asked and not all of it? Is that adherence or do we label them as non-adherence? How do we measure adherence? Many measures, as I'm sure you guessed, are self-reported by individuals. We're not going to go home with our patients and watch them every single day of every single minute. How can we use uh, digital technology? How can we think about adherence measures so that we can really understand patients' behaviors? Because we know that people have social desirability bias. If you ask as the physio student, what have you, have you done what I've asked you to do? People like to agree and say, yes, I've done everything that you've said. They might not always, but there is that sort of, you know, we, people don't want to let down their, their health um, professional who spent time and, and energy on them. There's lots of interventions that have been studied to look at whether if you do something, it will increase adherence. But the literature in a nutshell says there is no single intervention that will enhance adherence. Different things work for different people. And I don't think that's rocket science. I think we know that everybody's different. So having one intervention for everybody with low back pain, you know, do this and it will mean everyone will adhere is not going to happen. And that's pretty much in a nutshell what the adherence intervention literature suggests. Um, the big question is, if people do adhere, does it improve outcomes? So if they do exactly what you've asked of them, will they have improved outcomes? And that comes down to you choosing optimal dosage and optimal interventions that we know are evidence based so that we know that you have to meet that optimal threshold in order to get the, the improvement. Perhaps if you only do half as much as you've been asked, that won't be sufficient to actually see the outcome. Um, so the link between adherence and, out and, and outcomes is complex. Um, there's lots of barriers identified and lots of enablers, and you've already perfectly identified many of them just there. And I just want to introduce this concept of treatment fidelity when we look at um, randomized controlled trials or studies that look at um, certain interventions, particularly complex interventions, including exercise programs. So let's take, um, let's say we're studying a certain exercise intervention for shoulder pain. Um, we need to understand in that study how it's actually implemented in the study, because if the patients in the study only do half as much of what the um, intended intervention was set out to do. And we say, oh no, that doesn't work. That the, the randomized controlled trial shows that that intervention didn't work. It may be not that the intervention doesn't work at that dosage, but actually the people in actually doing it didn't actually do it in the way, in the dosage, in the, um, the way it was exactly described. And that's known as treatment fidelity. So we need to understand, has the treatment been implemented as intended? And that causes us lots of issues when we think about research and complex interventions like exercise. Um, I'm just going to move this on. So I'm going to introduce you to the behavior change wheel um, and the COMB model. And this is what I used as the theory to underpin my study. So this was developed by a, a lady called Susan Mickey um, and colleagues, and it was published in 2011 in a journal called Implementation Science, and the reference is at the end. And some of you have already been introduced to this model. And 
it's a synthesis of lots of different health behavior models. So there's lots of different models that have been developed over the years to describe why people do certain health behaviors or don't. So how do we get people to stop smoking, reduce alcohol, get active, etc. And what Susan Mickey and colleagues did was they synthesized all of this theory together in the several papers that have been published that explain all this, but they bring them all together. And the way it works is this, this wheel is a spinny wheel. So there's a little pivot in the middle and the green and the red and the gray spin around each other. And in the center is what we call the first stage, which is undertaking a behavioral diagnosis. So some of those questions I asked at the beginning, what is the behavior that needs to change? And the question is, what is why is that behavior happening or not be happening? And we undertake um, a COMBI assessment and the COM stands for capability, opportunity and motivation. And it's based on the US criminal justice system, which suggests that for somebody to be proven to have, undertake, uh, have carried out a crime, they have to have the capability, the opportunity and the motive. So it, it's based on some psychological theory as well, but this idea that for somebody to do something, they've got to have both the psychological and physical capability to do that behavior. They've got to have the social and physical opportunity, and they've got to have both the automatic and reflective motivation. And the automatics like the habit, the sort of instinctive motivation, and the reflective is the sort of planned, you know, I'm going to undertake this behavior. And if you don't have all of those acting together at that moment in time, that behavior won't happen. OK, so when the idea is that you look at an individual behavior and you understand what it is that's happening or not happening, that, that's um, preventing that behavior from being enacted. And once you know that, you can think about, well, what's the intervention that I then need to choose for that particular scenario? And the interventions in the behavior change wheel are in red. So it might be that you need to do more education. That is, that's the intervention. It might be you need to do persuasion. It might be you need to incentivize. You might need to coerce, train, enable, model that behavior or restructure the environment. And I'm gonna give you an example of an early study that used the behavior change wheel. And they said, why do nurses not use hand gel on the wards? Okay, so quite a simple scenario. They've got the capability, they're physically capable of pressing the pump and using the hand gel. They're psychologically capable, they've got the cognitive planning skills to walk up to it, know what to do, work out the process. They've got the motivation because they know why it's so important. They, they, they all want to do it. They're telling us they, what, they know how important infection control is. Uh, they've got the social opportunity, everyone around them thinks it's a good idea. They've got this environment that's been structured that has signs and reminders. But guess what? Nobody's filling up the, um, the dispensers. So we've got everything else in place, but when they go to press it, oh, it's empty. I'm not gonna go and do it again next time because it's always empty. So the, the intervention is to restructure the environment and that way you may enable the behavior to happen. So it's a really sim that's a really simplistic idea, but the idea is that you need to have all three of those components there. The gray around the edge is the policy function. So there at population level, what might be useful to put in place. Um, and we've seen this with COVID as we're trying to get people to undertake all of these different behaviors, social distancing, wearing masks. Do you need to, um, put in legislation? Do you need to plan the environment differently? Do you need to put in regulation, uh, et cetera? So the combi can be used for any behavior by any group of, of individuals, and that can be us as therapists and physiotherapists or our patients. And the idea is that the capability, the opportunity, the motivation um, all work together to result in that behavior. So 
this, my particular study was to explore how we provide self-management physiotherapy programs. Going back to that very first thing I talked about, how I saw patients were given an exercise program and perhaps um, didn't sort of always value that or, or adhere to them. And I think it's really important when we're thinking of that combi as about thinking about the physio's behavior in how they um, actually provide that program to the individual and then the patient's behaviors in terms of whether they adhere or not. So I'm just gonna whiz over the methodology. These slides are quite full just so they make sense when if, if you want to read over them separately. But I did a qualitative study using aspects of ethnography, which is where we observe people in a specific environment. And I studied just 11 patients from two different NHS physiotherapy departments in the Northwest of England. And I studied them over their first two appointments, which, which was, and then a follow-up a, a few weeks later. So it was about eight to 10 weeks of their physiotherapy treatment. And what I did was I videoed their first appointment with the physiotherapist. I then interviewed the patient about five days later, asking them about their capability, opportunity, and motivation to adhere. Were they doing the, what were they given? Were they doing it? What was difficult? What, you know, did they have the opportunity, uh, motivation, et cetera? And then I repeated that at the second appointment, uh, videoed the second appointment, and then interviewed them again. I also did a questionnaire immediately after the two appointments to ask them what they could recall. So what were you asked to do today? And some statements that link with the cave capability, opportunity and motivation um, domains asking about, you know, are you, do you feel capable you could do this? Are you going to have the opportunity, etc. And then I did the same with a follow up questionnaire at the end. So this was a longitudinal study to see what happened um, regarding those, that, those capability, opportunity and motivation domains. And what was really important for me was I was observing what really happened in those appointments rather than what physiotherapists tell us they do. And I think that's a really important distinction. So that's just a summary of, of what we did. And I also embedded myself in the department. So I was there to turn the video on and off. I was watching, I was seeing what was going on. I looked at the environment. Did the physio have access to a computer to print out exercise sheets? Was the radio on? How busy was it? How, what was the feel and, and what was sort of going on as, as this was all happening? So I collected some data around the actual self-management programs and I'm just gonna whiz over this really. because um, So I don't think it'll be any surprise, home exercises were by far the most common self-management strategies provided, um, followed by activity modification and the use of heat at home. And then the, um, the slides on the right is are my different participants. And I was able to um, understand this was the green is the first appointment and the blue is the second appointment for exercise prescription. So you'll see some most patients got some more exercises at the second appointment. Some didn't change. Uh, they, they stuck with the same exercises that were given. I looked at how long we spent. So I analyzed the videos. Um, and an average first appointment was 40 minutes. Um, and the, the physio spent an average of 13% of that appointment, five minutes, 52 te speech teaching exercise and a minute 30 teaching non-exercise. And in the second appointment, 18 minutes total. And you can see 25% of the appointment spent teaching exercise and 7% teaching non-exercise. So what did we find when we looked at how physiotherapists um, actually provided the program and did they address patients' capability, opportunity and motivation? And what I found was that physios focused predominantly on capability. Could the patients do it? Did they know what to do? Could they physically do the exercises? Did they have the sort of physical and, and psychological capability. Although practice was very variable and I only had six physiotherapists treating those 11 patients. So some physios saw more than one patient in the study. Um, and the practice just between six physios varied quite, quite widely. They all used verbal instructions to teach. Um, many used demonstrations. Um, 
some about half gave patients an opportunity to have a go at the exercise in the appointment. 50% gave a printed exercise sheet, but nobody got any sort of video material to show, show the patient or help them remember what they were doing. Um, and a couple used strategies like summarizing, asking the patient to repeat back what they've been given. Um, but by far the verbal instructions and the demonstrations were, were the most common teaching methods. And interestingly, if the exercise was done in lying, um, either crook lying or, or lying down in any way, the demonstration the physio did didn't wasn't a, a true demonstration. It was sort of a, a mimicking thing. So let's say you were getting them to do a pelvic tilt. You They didn't lie on the bed and demonstrate. They just sort of had a go at something similar or did that to show feet going up and down. So really interesting to watch what actually physios do in, in practice. Really interesting was that I didn't observe any explicit shared decision making. So it was all very much, here's an exercise program and I'm going to teach it you and I'm going to make sure you can do it and away we go. But there was no, do you want to do this? Is this something we, we were going to act on together as a plan? Nobody explored goals, which I think is quite, quite surprising, perhaps. And I'm sure all you guys are learning about the importance of goal setting as part of your assessment, understanding the patient. And there's probably lots of reasons for that. This isn't about being critical about physios. There's lots of things that influence that. But we didn't see any sort of true goal setting. And I didn't see any exploration of beliefs, expectations or intentions about what the patient thought they were going to be getting out of physiotherapy. And two physiotherapists asked about the physical environment, about will you have a step on which to do these exercises and are you able to lie down on the floor? So two, two physios sort of explored that a little bit. OK, um, in terms of um, the... So that's just a summary, really, of what the physios did. The, the programs really varied in detail and complexity, but they tended to be really simple. There was this idea that we'll give you something really simple to do, then you can do it. We'll en enable that capability by keeping it dead simple. Movements that are just part of daily activity, not going to flare up your pain, really keep it simple. And I'll tell you how the patients viewed that in a second. Um, the environment that the physio worked in seemed to affect the prescription. So um, whether they had access to a computer, how much time they had, what was going on sort of in the department sort of seemed to play a part. And I saw that printed information was a bit ad hoc. Every single patient was offered printed information, but the way the physio offered it affected how it appeared to be taken up. So when they said, I've printed this off. Would you like it? They all said yes. They just handed it over and they took it. When the physio said at the very end, as we were closing the appointment, saying, I can write those down for you if you like, all the patients said, no, it's fine. Don't worry. So there's something about, you know, patients, um, how, how we engage them in, in accepting or, or influence their, the, whether they accept written information. And that content and dosage was very vague. There was lots of just do what you can. Let's start gradual and build up rather than really saying, I want you to do 10 of these or 50 of these or 500 of these. It was very sort of flexible. And if we think back to adherence, how do we measure then if someone's being adherent, if there isn't really an amount that we're asking them to do? And the purpose of the uh, programmes was not really discussed. There wasn't really any reference to whether you're going to do these for a few weeks, whether these are forever, or sort of how you might transition them into to lifelong um, physical activity. I'm just going to pause there for a minute just to check with you, Steph, we're all OK. All yeah. looking good. Good, excellent. All right, we'll... we'll whistle on and then hopefully we've got some time for some Q&A. Um, so in terms of, um, oh sorry I seem to have gone backwards there, my apologies, I can't get this to click on. Um, in terms of what the patients thought, there was four overarching themes and 20 sub-themes and they're all there, I'll let you read through them in, uh, 
on the slides at a later date. But the four overarching themes were about knowledge and memory, the influence of others, and that came across in your word cloud there, some of that peer pressure, peer support, uh, goals and motivation. So interesting, remember I said that none of the physios explored patients' goals, but they actually all had, when you dug a bit deeper in the interview, they all had goals and motivations that of why they were one, why they were adhering and, and why they wanted to engage with physiotherapy. And really interestingly, patients personalized the programs to suit their own needs. However flexible they were given, they did what fitted their lifestyle. So if they, if the physio said, I want you to use a towel and do it this way and don't move this and only do six and the patients did what they felt was right for them with their environment, their time available, what they just preferred. So that was a really interesting finding. And the patients generally focused much more on motivational and opportunity aspects rather than capability. So perhaps because their capability had been addressed quite well, they perhaps didn't talk about that so much perhaps, but they really focused on liking the flexibility. But remember I said everything was simple. Many of them said it's boring, it's monotonous. Are you actually joking? I go to the gym three times a week and you've given me two exercises. You know, this is not enough for me. It's boring. It's you know, I'm not going to see you for another three weeks and you've given me three exercises. So there was this real feeling that patients needed a challenge. They all had goals and motivations, as I said, and the patients in my study all had very high levels of activation and wanted to play their part. They were influenced by wanting to please their physiotherapist and they had good relationships. The therapeutic relationship was really, really influential. Remember, these patients volunteered to take part in my study. So that suggests perhaps that they were quite proactive anyway, that they were keen on sort of getting involved in physiotherapy. So we can only, there's only a limit to where we can take the, the findings of this. They all expressed a preference for group exercise, but none of them were offered it. And as I say, patients all personalized things. These are some of the quotes. I'm just, I'll just give you a little bit of a chance to have a read and the colours relate to the, the capability, um, opportunity and motivation domains. This was a really interesting one, the top left. Um, this is about, would you feel guilty if you didn't do them? You can't put everything on hold to do an exercise because you can do it at any time. This idea that I'm not going to be sort of rigidly, I'm alive, have to carry on. And that's been found in the literature as well. And um, this personalization, I'll just ditch one of them, the foot exercise, but I'll still do the others because that one's causing me problems. So I'm not interested in doing it. So this idea that whatever you say, you know, patients still have that choice to be able to decide whether they want to do it. And one of my patients out of just 11 people couldn't read and they declined the written sheet, but didn't say why. Um, but actually it wouldn't have worked. It, uh, this individual participant said, I, you know, it wouldn't have worked for me because I couldn't read. So again, this assumption and, and this idea that, um, that, that, you know, everybody uh, can follow those in instructions. So the conclusions of this study were really that the COMBI and the TDF, and I haven't really talked about the TDF, but that's the underpinning psychological constructs of the COMBI. So that's things like, um, decision making, expectations about the outcome, all the different things that, are, that drive capability, opportunity and motivation. So it's like the scaffolding underneath. Um, and there's some references at the end if you do want to look a little bit more into those. Um, is the, there's a bit of debate in the literature about whether the COMBI model is too prescriptive or, or perhaps it, it makes everyone fit into a box. But actually, I would argue that as non-psychologists, as physiotherapists, this is a really useful and easy way for us to sort of consider quite complex psychology and behavioral um, change. And really interestingly, that we don't, the physios in my study paid very little attention and time to non-exercise strategies. So heat, 
um, you know, doing activity modification. They were sort of passing comments, whereas everybody focused more on making sure patients could do exercise. So if we're going to give people non-exercise things to do at home, we need to give them the time and attention so that we know that patients understand them. None of the patients in my study recalled that they'd been asked to do anything that wasn't exercise. So again, I don't know why, but but they didn't see that as self-management. There's possible misalignment between capability, opportunity and motivation with the physios focusing more on capability. And um, really one of my messages is that we need more behavioral science in the pre-reg education. And some of you are already getting that, perhaps some will be getting it when you develop through your programs, but we need to see that as widespread. Okay, I'm going to just move on quickly to personalised care. Um, personalised care, there's a link on this uh, blue title if uh, you want to have a look at the NHS Web England web pages. Um, there's similar ideas in Scotland. It's an NHS England thing, but it doesn't mean that it's not applicable wherever you are. It's a huge thing. If you've not heard of personalised care, I'm sure you will be hearing about it at some point in your programme. And really, it's about supporting patients to be really equal partners in their care. So any care we're delivering as healthcare professionals should be using the ethos of personalised care, enabling choice, shared decision making, supporting social prescribing and ongoing connections into the community so people can support self-management long term. Um, understanding what's important to an individual so that we tailor treatment to meet their needs not making assumptions about what people know or what they don't know what they want what they don't want and one part of personalized care are the patient activation measures which you may or may not have come across and the blue link at the bottom is a quick guide to using patient activation measures and it might be something you want to look at when you're on a placement or when you're looking and thinking about delivering and, and helping patients with supported self-management, it's about how ready is that person in terms of take it, playing an active part in their, their self-management. And it's a 13 question um, questionnaire that, that has levels of answer uh, aligned with these four levels. So level one is disengaged and overwhelmed and their perspective is my doctor or health professional is in charge of my health. So it's a very passive position. Um, adherence is poor. You know, you tell me what to do and, you know, you do it all and, and I'm going to play a very small part right through to maintaining behaviours and pushing further. I'm my own advocate. I know what I'm doing to look after my long term condition, my back pain, my OA knee, my shoulder pain. I'm really understand the factors, how they influence and what what I can do. And they're really sort of very much in control of their own uh, their own sort of self care. So the patient activation measures can be a really useful tool. But also I'm proposing that the COMB model can be used really to personalise care because what I didn't see in my study particularly was really personalised care. I think the physios wanted to do that and they gave patients lots of flexibility, but perhaps very much around the capability and needed to be developed perhaps more around opportunity and motivation. Now, I understand this is really small on this slide. You won't be able to read it necessarily, but it's really around asking, taking away the questions to ask your patient, does the patient have the capability to do what you're asking them to do? Do you, have you provided printed or video materials that suits the patient's preferences and health literacy? Will they remember it? Have they got the skills to plan and prioritize it into their day? Will they have the opportunity? Will people laugh at them? If they go home and say, I've got these exercises to lie on the floor and you know, lift my hips off the floor, what, what will their, the people they live with think? Have they got any social support? Um, do they, are they motivated? Do they care? What, have they got a reason for doing this? Do they think it will work? Um, do they think actually it's going to be useless, so what's the point and their motivation is low? So are they too, what's going to happen if they're too tired or too busy? Will the sheet go in the bin? How will they get back on track? 
So these are all questions that I would challenge you to, to talk to your patients about. So think about what the behavior is that you're asking patients to do and are, do they really understand it? Think about your own behavior. So do you need to change your behavior and what are the com B? You know, have you got the capability, opportunity and motivation to teach exercise and to provide self-management in a really effective way? Think about self-efficacy and patient activation and think about being an equal partner. Don't think about just assuming and telling people what to do because you think about how you what what motivates you to do behaviors and what all those barriers are that you thought about at the beginning. So think and ask capability, opportunity, motivation. OK, thank you very much indeed for listening. So I'm going to um, stop sharing those slides now and I'm going to see if anybody at all would like to um, ask me any questions at all. We have a question from Emma in the chat. Um, yeah, do you think you might have seen physios addressing more of the areas that were missed if they had more time? Brilliant question, Emma. And I have just written an editorial in this month's physiotherapy journal, so a little sly plug there for, for that, which is about how do we reset the new normal in MSK physio services after COVID? So we've seen this huge shift to online, haven't we? And I know some of you asked questions beforehand about how the telehealth thing works. Remember that the physio model of seeing a patient for, let's say, 40 minutes and then them coming back for a 20 minute appointment and then the next week was set up in the 50s after the post-war sort of need for physiotherapy after the Second World War. And that's when we did loads of electrotherapy, loads of hands on. And the patient came for like maybe two or three times a week and we did this treatment to them for, for a, a certain amount of weeks and then we discharged them. Now, evidence-based treatment and self-management and exercise and behavior change is very, very different, yet we still have this same model of 40 minutes, do your assessment, maybe give them a couple of things to do, send them away, but oh, guess what? That gap now between that first and second appointment is now three weeks, four weeks in some departments, and that patient's left all that time sort of with whatever you've given them to do. So. I think the structure, including the time of the appointment, Emma, is absolutely crucial because to do really good patient engagement and really understand where patients are coming from, I think it takes time. It takes a lot of emotional energy from us as physiotherapists. I left, if I'm really honest, I left MSK. I was a senior one in a department. I left because I knew that seeing back-to-back -back patients all day, I was not giving them my best. I was, you know, I'd heard so many people, you know, talk to me about pain and challenges. And I, I knew if I was really on my game, I could do a really good job. But when it was towards the end of the day and I had notes to write and I had, you know, things to do and, you know, pressures are piling up in the department, you know, things get a bit lazy you don't do everything that you that you should be you know you should be doing and I think we really do need to look as we move beyond COVID and we reset for a new normal about what how would we design a physio service if we were starting from scratch with all the technology we've got with text messaging with emails with video calls with face-to-face -face, with groups you know would we design this sort of 40 minute appointment followed by these others? So I think we need to think about how we use our time so we avoid burnout for our physiotherapists as well. So, yes, I think is the, the, the short answer. And I'm sorry if I gave you a very long answer. Um, um, Somebody's put, Alex has put a question about adopting a different approach and language style. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest piece of advice I've, I've learned in all the work I've done around public health and health promotion is you know what you know, and you sort of grow up thinking that everybody thinks like you. Many of you have had privileged backgrounds. You'll have had different experiences. Some of you will have had 
sort of quite tough times. Some of you will, you know, you'll all have had different experiences, but some of you will live completely different lives than some of the, the different sectors of your communities that you serve. And we must be really cognizant of understanding language, um, societal impacts about the environments our patients live in. And that's why embedding service user opinion and, and input into your service design, your feedback, your development is absolutely critical. Otherwise, you could be talking a completely different language. And, and I've worked in the middle of, and I'm going to use Salford as an example, because that's where I've worked. There's some really sort of affluent parts of Salford and there's some really deprived parts. And, you know, me talking about you should be doing this and you should be doing that. When that person's thinking, do you know what? You're talking about me coming. I don't have the bus fare to get here. I'm trying to weigh up whether I feed my kids or I come to your physio appointment. You know, it's a completely different perspective. And, and we've got to get under the skin of that. And language is really important. So look at the populations um, that you that you look after and understand those populations. Listen to, to their situation. We had a, message, a question from Rosie. Um, you mentioned group exercise being a preference. Why do you think we don't offer this service? My impression is physios used to offer this more frequently. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think I've worked in departments a uh, long time ago where we had the gym open and the, you know, the radios on and patients are doing their physio and you might have two or three patients in there. So there's that sort of group where they're doing their own thing, but they're in a sort of social environment. I think we do have groups and some places are really good at it. I think the Escape Pain Programme is an absolute perfect example of really good supported self-management and transitioning people with long-term conditions. So that's the Escape Pain Programme for OA Knee, if you've not come across that. And many departments are picking that up. Um, so I think it's about, it's really hard when you're in a department, you're trying to manage demand, there's a waiting list to sort of stop and reset and say, let's use the resource, the amount of staff, the time, the, the facilities we've got in a different way. And that the CSP, that's what we're really trying to get services to think about is how do we shift? We've seen first contact practice, so we've seen physios move up the pathway for MSK, so how do we shift the outpatient model to really deliver what patients and, and the public really want from that? So, um, yeah, I think that's really, really interesting point. And I think group exercise, there's a really great report I'd, I'd, if you, I'd ask you to read. It's the NA National Institute for Health Research at 2019, um, moving, oh God, I've suddenly forgot it, moving forward, I think it's called, um, and it's a, an evaluation of all different interventions, uh, of physiotherapy interventions for musculoskeletal, and many of those are group based. So we've got to look at embedding really good quality group exercise. And for me, every patient should be offered group exercise if it's what they want. And um, but we're, we're miles from from that point. Um, so. We have a question from Sabine. Um, in current times, do you think there's a role for digital technologies to try and help people adhere to prescribed exercise? I absolutely do, um, Sabina. I think um, that's sort of what I'm talking about with resetting. You know, maybe it's a longer, a much longer first appointment and then daily text messages. Maybe that's annoying. People might not want those. There's something about tailoring it to the individual, so not assuming that everyone wants to be bombarded. One of the patients in my study said, I'd love to receive text messages. It'd just give, I live on my own. It'd just give me that nudge. Other people might find that an absolute, you know, irritant in the world of, you know, too much technology. So I think absolutely we need to think about all the mechanisms um, that we can sort of touch base you could there's some services that say you know rate on a scale of one to five today how you've got on with your exercise program um so yeah I think but I don't again interventions one size doesn't fit all it's about tailoring the the digital technology and the plan with the patient for me 
Um, from Jessica, she asked, for patients with high expectations, how can we help with adherence? Um, high expectations, are you, do you mean in terms of what they want from us? As in, am, is, am I reading that right? That you mean, you know, their high expectations in what they're going to get from us? Because some patients want lots of hands-on and because they think that's what is right for them and, and that might be really good for them and it might be part of what you want to offer. Um, so there's something about helping patients understand expectations and what you, how the sort of treatment you're planning, that evidence-based care aligns with their expectations. Because if you don't, that's part of the therapeutic relationship. If you don't get that right, you're going to be doing something and they're going to expect something else and they're going to go away. And, and people are very polite. Can I just, it's really important that just because your patient comes and says, yes, I'm doing it, or yes, thank you very much, and they don't, turn, I'm, I'm loads better, thank you very much, goodbye, it doesn't mean they haven't gone to the local private physiotherapist, or they haven't gone to seek that help somewhere else, so really understanding what drives people, and what their expectations are, will help you have that conversation as equal partners, to understand really, if you're on the same page, and not everyone's ready, not everyone is ready, and if they say, for me, if they say, you know, this isn't for me, your exercises, I'm sort of pretty happy, I'll just carry on. Let's not waste resources on people that aren't ready. Let them know they can come back into the system really easily without bothering the GP when they're ready and if they're ready. Um, so, yeah, I think it should be a much more fluid relationship. We have a question from Zoe. I often find patients ta are taken by surprise when I ask them what they expect to gain from physiotherapy. A large amount of them say they don't know what we can offer. Would more patient education be more appropriate prior to attending an appointment? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think there's something about really, and these are really good service improvement ideas. If you're on placements where you're being asked to look at leadership placements or um, placements where perhaps you're in a, an environment and you're trying to think about what would improve, improve the care. Um, again, don't assume that that's what patients want. Get a little group of patients together, ask them what would have helped you know, would information, they might say, you know what, no, because I haven't got time to read it. I just want to come and ask you on the day. So again, don't make assumptions, engage with your service users, understand what they want that service to look like. Patient and public involvement is pivotal, but it could be a solution that you give them. Some of you might send them a little video of what your service offers, what it doesn't offer. That might be a really nice idea. You might send them a text message you know, this is what we're going to be doing on and this is what we're likely to do. Um, but you've got to have that conversation. Some patients want are happy to be left. You know, I've had patients where I've talked about, you know, should we lift you for a knee replacement? Do you want to, you know, are you ready or you're not? And they'll say, sorry, doctor, you know, and I'll say I'm not a doctor, but here we go. You know, different people want different levels of engagement in their care. And that's OK but at least give them that opportunity to have that conversation. Um, um, we had something from a number ending 938. Um, do you feel <laughs> though that there is a certain glass ceiling to our care patient adherence due to social determinants of health? Um, well, social determinants of health are the thing that is going to affect how people sort of what people do, what they, they believe, what they, their, you know, their experiences. And if you're not familiar with the social determinants of health, uh, what Do um, Dolgren and Whitehead's rainbow, please do see that because it stops you thinking about, you know, when you see that obese patient in front of you, the worst thing you can do is think it's your behavior, you know, it's you as an individual that's caused that obesity because it isn't it's an absolute myriad of health social determinants of health that will be affecting that so I think you've got to understand that there may be limitations people might not be ready for what you want to you you might be like jumping up and down thinking I know if you did this you would get better but you've got to get the person to that point and patient activation measures are a really nice way to help get them some of that way but it, it might be in five years time they're ready and think back to your own behaviors 
Um, it, it's normal that you do something in January and you fall off the wagon and that's okay. So let people go through those cycles and don't punish them for not doing as we tell them as physio terrorists. And let's never go to sort of that, that sort of nickname again, because it, you know, it really is about engaging with our patients. Um, from Patricia, you mentioned thinking about a different approach to physiotherapy and thinking about a new approach if you were to start up. I'm interested to hear if you could change one thing, what would you change initially? Oh, one thing. Um, I would, um, oh, I can't think of one thing because I think the, the one thing I would do is I would sit down with all of my stakeholders in the room. So my patients, the people who run the service, the, the people from the local community and just ask them what a good physiotherapy service would look like. Because I think for me to say, you know, we need half an hour for a new appointment or an hour or we should do text messages. I just think we, we're going back down the wrong route again. And I think it's that really understanding what that population needs, because it may be that we need to push our service right into the heart of that community of hard to reach individuals. You know, coming to the hospital that's really busy, that is a nightmare to get to and park at, that might be the biggest barrier. And unless we change where we deliver our service from, we're on a road to nowhere. So for me, you've got to ask the patients and service users and the community what they want of that service. I'm conscious of time, but we've got, yep, we'll so try nice. and get through a couple of more. Um, so um, we could go late into now. I could talk about this. All night, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so Razia said um, that they used to run a community gym and clients had existing physio programs, but when asked if they did, they said they didn't. So Razia encouraged them to bring their exercise sheets and supervise them to make sure they did it. Um, do you think there's scope for a similar model where physios liaise with exercise champions in the community? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's where things like escape pain work really well, because I think you've got to build self-efficacy. If you're not an exerciser, you know, many of you will be used to exercise and you'll have grown up around exercise. You know, it's a good thing. But imagine a different world. You've grown up, you do exercise and it makes you sweaty. It really hurts and you feel terrible. Why would you keep doing that? Nobody around you exercises why would I do that? You know, I look stupid. I feel horrible. Why would I do that? Now you do it. Many of us do it because we know it's good for us. And if you think about this girl can, it's that breaking some of those boundaries about, you know, how we, we know, you know, some of the things that put people off exercising. So um, I think it's really important that you build self-efficacy. You give people an opportunity to do their physiotherapy, do their exercises, do their rehab with us in a supervised environment with peer support. They see other people doing it. Oh, okay, they're doing it. I don't look so silly. Actually, I'm getting the hang of this. I've got someone there to help me. And then as we need to be transitioning people into long-term physical activity. So we need to be thinking about where would they engage with their community to do this type of, of activity or something that, that they like. And I really like the idea of hand holding, not sign posting. So rather than going, right, that's it. Six of treatments finished. You've been, the group's ended. Here's a leaflet. You can go down the road to the local leisure centre. Off you go. That's a huge leap turning up to the yoga class and feeling like, you know, I've been to classes and you feel an absolute idiot. You know, and I'm, you know, know a bit about exercise. So what about building in, right, the next session, we're going to come with you to your first exercise class and we're just going to sit on the side and we're going to be here if you have a flare up. You know, what a different idea. And they go, oh, actually, I met somebody and um, it was really nice and I managed OK. OK, next week we'll do it again. And then actually the week after you're going to go on your own, but you can ring me if there's a problem. And I think we've got to be much more realistic about helping people transition into long term, because what they then develop is they build community networks and resilience. 
So if you've got an OA knee and it flares up and you're sat at home on your own and you don't know anybody, who do you ring when your knee gets sore? You pick up the phone to your doctor or because you probably can't get through to a physio because you've been discharged and you create a GP appointment. When actually, if you've met Brenda or David or somebody at the class, that you know you go oh my knee's been bad this week and they go oh my knee's been bad as well and you build these resilient communities that can cope and they don't rely on health resource so it feels a bit airy fairy and a bit long-winded but we these things potentially work really well but it's a total different mindset so yes I think we've got to allow people to come to physio and support them to build the skills and capabilities build the motivation and then transition them and think about long-term uh, physical activity or, or rehabilitation for their condition. Thanks, Jill. I think we'll take one more question because um, I think we've lost a third of our audience. But um, is there any... No problem. From Adam, is there any resources, references you could recommend to us as I'm doing a project on something similar, but in paediatrics? Yeah, there's some um, references at the end there. Um, they will lead you to many, many more. There's a paper on adherence by Bailey et al. from 2019 that just talks through some of the, um, the challenges. So there's quite a few references at the end, yeah. I'm happy to try and... I know a lot of what I've talked about is quite big and it's hard for you to think about how you're going to influence that, but you guys are going out there into practice and can really change the world. You know, you don't have to design services that have looked the same since the, the 1940s, okay? So really do take those small changes. And if nothing else, just have that conversation with your patient, be it online, be it face-to-face, -face, understand their world, what they want, what they'll find really difficult. Have they got the capability, opportunity and motivation and if they haven't, how can you help build and, and nurture that in them? So just have a go. It's not easy having some of those conversations. You feel like you're opening a can of worms sometimes, but you will really build in confidence. And if you can practice it now as you're learning your craft, um, it will pay absolute dividends. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, Really lovely to see so many of you here. Keep going. You're doing a fantastic job studying in such hard times. Um, keep taking every placement opportunity that's offered to you. Um, it might look a bit different than the one your friends got or the one you thought you were going to get. But believe you me, um, it might change your way you think completely and set you up. So so just keep going with with working with your with your lecturers and, and take any opportunity you can. And hopefully we'll see you on the next uh, webinar. So thanks to Steph for organising these events um, and do stay connected with us on Twitter and post and keep connected on, on Twitter and ask any questions and I'll try and sort of answer them on there if you wish. <laughs>